Hello everyone, welcome back to our farming RPG tutorial series. Today we're building on our improved inventory system by setting up a complete storage system for our game. Let's begin with a small but important fix. You might have noticed that our item cursor doesn't scale properly with different screen sizes. And at certain screen resolutions, we can't click on our slots because the cursor is in the way. That's because we're using world space coordinates instead of the canvas space. In our selected item display script, we need to get a reference to the parent canvas first. Then in the update method, instead of using input.mouseposition directly, we'll convert it to our local canvas coordinates using rect transform utility screen point to local point in rectangle. This ensures our cursor follows the mouse properly regardless of screen resolution or canvas scaling. Much better. Now let's create our storage containers. These will be interactable objects that players can use to store their items. I'm using a new script with three types of storage. Food, items, and tools. Each storage type will serve a specific purpose in organizing the player's inventory. The storage container needs a unique identifier for the Blackboard system. I made an assign storage ID method that just adds the prefix to the storage type. This assumes that the player only has one of each storage type, which works for our current setup. If you want to make this more complex, like handling multiple storage containers on the same type in the game, you can easily do so by tweaking this function. When players interact with the storage, we can log the storage type for now as a sanity check. Let's place our storage containers in the scenes. I'm adding three containers, a toolbox for equipment and seeds, a cabinet for general items, and a fridge for food items. In keeping with the Friends of Mineral Town game, let's leave the toolbox outside while keeping the other two in the player's house. And each container gets the appropriate storage type assigned. Now when players interact with these containers, they'll trigger our storage system. And now let's build our storage system. Now when the player opens the storage containers, we want the screen to show the right things. And that comprises of two things. What the player has in his inventory that is relevant to the storage container, and what is in the storage container. So let's create the storage manager static class to handle all storage operations. We're making it static because we don't really need it as a mono behavior instance to be there. We already have a lot of them. And the manager uses our blackboard system to persist storage data. The core method gets storage lists, retrieves or creates the storage lists from the blackboard. And each storage type gets its own list using the prefix storage underscore plus the type name. If the list is empty on the first access, we can initialize it with 12 empty slots. The get relevant player inventory method returns two slots for tool storage and item slots for everything else. It creates a separation between the different inventory types. And the can store in type method enforces storage rules. Tools and seeds go into the toolbox. Food items go into the fridge. Everything else goes into the general item cabinet. Now let's get the UI to display the items. We'll make a new class, Storage UI Manager, to handle the display of the storage interface. The UI adapts based on storage type with different headings and inventory sections. We'll have constants for the display names, and the rendering system uses dynamic slot creation. In Render Player Inventory, we first clear the existing slots and then create new ones for each inventory slot. An important feature is constraint enforcement. We disable slots for items that can't be stored in the current container. Similarly, the render storage contents method works the same way, creating slots for the contents of the storage container. Notice how storage slots get their own inventory type enum value which is going to be crucial for updating our inventory system. This gets us to the tricky part, figuring out how to move items between the storage and inventory. 
Since we already have a robust way of handling the inventory, we can build on it to also handle movement for storage. The key inside is detecting when the storage panel is open. In inventory slot, I modified the move entire stack method to let storage manager take over when the storage panel is open. For the most part, it follows the same logic as our inventory to hand and hand to inventory functions, except to the storage slots. Now onto the selection logic. I added cases for storage in the selection to slot function and in slot to selection. The inventory manager now recognizes when the storage panel is open. Instead of moving items to the player's hand, clicking an item transfers it between the storage and inventory. And now after testing it, I found that the right-click functionality is completely broken in the storage screen. Who knew destroying and recreating UI objects would lead to this? So I completely rewrote the storage UI rendering system instead of dynamically creating and destroying slot objects i now use pre-placed slots in the ui this is more performant and it gives better control over the layout the only thing is that i actually have to create and assign these slots in the inspector after more hours of debugging i found a bug in the right click functionality it was checking the wrong slot for quantity a simple variable name fix fixes it. The constraint system got enhanced too. Slots disable themselves when they contain items that don't belong in the current storage type. But there's a catch, only if the slot isn't empty. Empty slots stay enabled because players need somewhere to put compatible items. And then I realized we can't save the game now. Because we are using item data and it is the age old problem that we cannot serialize scriptable objects. In all previous videos, we had to create a new safe state class and then handle the serializing and deserializing of data. But I kind of want to keep all of this on the blackboard. And in the future, we probably need to store more data types like these. So instead, let's create a new serialization registry system such that different data types can have their own serializers to convert each data type into something that can be saved. For now, we have one for item slot data lists. And let's start with the iBlackBot serializer interface. We need to set conditions to detect the type that we are going to serialize, and then another condition to detect the type that we are going to deserialize. So, for both ways. And then the serialization converts our runtime data to save data, and a deserialize function converts the save data to runtime data. And so, I implement this interface for our storage system with item slot data serializer. This serialization condition checks for the item slot data lists and converts our runtime data to save data. And then we can just copy over the same serialization logic that we had previously used from our inventory save system. And then the same for deserialization. And with that, the serializer converts item slot data objects to item slot save data arrays for saving, and then back again for loading. And this will all happen automatically when the blackboard serializes and deserializes. The blackboard serializer registry is our main static class that manages all the serializers and applies them during the save and load operations. It uses the runtime initialize on load method attribute to register serializers before the scene loads. And the registry processes all blackboard entries during the save and load. In game state manager, I call blackboard.serialize before saving and blackboard.deserialize after loading. It happens automatically when the blackboard serializes and deserializes. And now, when the player saves their game, the storage contents persist perfectly. And now when everything loads up, everything's exactly where they left it. And that's it for today's episode. If you run into any problems while following this tutorial, you can simply make a post, post your code on our forums like the others have. If you would like to download the project files for this series, they're available for our Silver Tier patrons. Thank you as always for your support, and I'll see you next time.